Hello everybody and welcome to the next Marketing Masterclass. Today we are joined by Anya Pierce and what we're going to be doing today is talking all about connecting the dots and I'm not going to go into too much detail because the conversation will become clearer as we go, i.e. we will connect the dots as we go. Um, so for those of you who are new to this crowdcast, my name is Simon Batchelor, I'm one of the co-founders of Better, Bolder, Braver and I'm joined by Francis. Hello everybody and welcome to another Marketing Masterclass, the Better, Bolder, Braver Marketing Masterclass. My name is Francis Khalashji and I am the other co-founder of the Better, Bolder, Braver community. And we are very happy today, already, before anything has even started, just to have Anya Pierce in our presence. I described this as what I imagined was going to be a campfire of an hour. Um, and if you've had a chance to read the description of this event, then you will know why. I don't normally read the description of events at the event, but on this occasion, the meta message being that things that we read can be very nourishing, I thought I would just very quickly introduce Anya by uh, reading to you something that I have cobbled together um, which is both my own thoughts and taken from Anya's wonderful coaching podcast um, website, which we will link to in the chat, and I encourage you all to have a look at it uh, at some point. Um, Anya is like the mobile libraries of our childhood. You would look forward to it arriving and be welcomed in with open arms to a cave of wonders filled with exciting and nourishing resources to cosy up with. She is the first to have a reassuringly apt reference in any conversation, be it a book, an article, a podcast, a poem. She can contextualise our experience in any moment with a wide world of others' experiences, reflections and wisdom, which is hugely comforting, inspiring and humbling. If we read to know that we are not alone, Anya compassionately shares what she's discovered to help us feel this directly. As a child, herself, she was baffled, yet intrigued by the behaviour of those around her, and now combines a researcher's curiosity, a poet's turn of phrase, and a comedian's sense of timing to help those she encounters gain insight and compassion into what, what they do. She's no stranger to tricky times, having lived with a disabling chronic illness for 16 years, reimagining it as her spiritual path helps her to bring a particular kind of hard-won grace, wisdom and empathy into her work. The Head of Positive Psychology at the Museum of Happiness, where she co-facilitates co their Certified Happiness Facilitator Training, she's an intuitive advisor and fellow of the Positive Psychology Guild. She consolidates her interest in the science of what makes life worth living. With an MSc in Applied Positive Psychology, focusing on the concept of self as instrument, how our own qualities of attention, openness and presence impact others and create our first intervention. Anya invites us to consider patterns, meaning and connection within ourselves and the universe to which we, are, we may previously have been blind. Dots can be connected, allowing patterns to appear, clarity and new ideas to flow. As a coach, you too are a treasure trove of magic for your clients and you can show up with it through bringing resources, energy, compassion and inspiration into your marketing as well as into your coaching practice. On the surface, this Marketing Masterclass is about repurposing content, resources and showing that you are the best guide for your ideal client. Underneath this time with Anya will be a mind-expanding dance with joy, a celebration of the self and about how to take things slowly. And I've said, Anya, that we will be talking to you about what it is to bring our full selves to our interactions and interventions to create moments between two people. So I thought I would repurpose my description <laughs> as an audio so that people could experience the passion with which I am approaching this conversation. So oh. I hope everybody enjoys this time. I am going to hand over to Anya to uh, introduce yourself 
any more if you would like to. And... I, I, I'm, I mean, <laughs> how, honestly, how, how can I follow any of that? I mean, it, it was like, there's an exercise, a values exercise, which says, you know, imagine what it would be like, you know, at your 80th birthday party and you have someone reading out, you know, their, you know what they love about you. And I just, I got goose, I'm getting goosebumps now. Just, you know, the, 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 the not so nice version is like someone reading your eulogy at your funeral. I thought I'd go for the 80th birthday party. It's a little bit more positive. It's a little bit more scope after that. But um I am exceedingly touched and I am so tickled that you compared me to the mobile library of your childhood because I used to work in a library. I used to help out the library as a sco- uh, when I was uh, um, in school and uh, it used to be my hidey place when I was a kid. So um, it resonated hugely with me. Um, but I know that you're, when we've talked about this, this topic and I know that you're looking into self-compassion, I think this month, um, at Better Boulder Braver, um, the community which I've just joined. Um, I'm just going to unpick self-compassion a little bit, just very briefly, um, because when we think of it, it's, it's this nebulous phrase, but one of the researchers I love, Dr. Krista Neff, has, has broken it down into three pillars, the mindfulness, self-kindness, and common humanity. And, you know, the mindfulness is being present in the moment. Where's your head at? You know, the self-kindness is, okay, so you, you, you're aware of what's going on with you. That gives you choicefulness now. Okay, so how can you best respond to that? You know, and, and, and I've been looking into some exciting theories to play with, which if we get to time, I, I, I will nerd out gracelessly on, but I'll just say, you know, how can we best respond to that? But the last piece is what you're talking about, I think, is this aspect of common humanity. I know for myself, I have had experiences which trigger such a sense of shame in me that my response is self-protective. My response is to withdraw from other people. And actually, recognizing myself in other people's words and other people's experiences helps me to bridge that gap. It is like someone extending a hand to me at those times and going, hey, yeah, me too. It doesn't show that you're not human. In fact, this shitty thing you're going through proves that you are very much human. You do belong in the human race because you're going through what you're going through rather than despite it. You know, the times when, you know, you, me- you mentioned the, the 16 years of uh, chronic illness, 16 and a half, I think it might be now. Um, you know, there are times when my body has failed me in public and I've relied on... <laughs> Uh, uh, the uh, the line, I think a streetcar named Desire, like Blanche de Bois, I've relied on the kindness of strangers um, <laughs> to uh, who have, you know, particularly on like public transport or whatever, offered to, uh, you know, carry me upstairs and things. I, I, I've, I've usually refused, um, but <laughs> usually, <laughs> um, but um, knowing that my relationship with my fragility informs another person's experience of it as well means that what I take away from those experiences is less the fear of of, of breaking in public and how that might cause me to be a burden on, on others and more the fact that when those things happen I am blessed I've got a little card somewhere which says, may you always be aware of the angels by your side. And I think, you know, being able to extract from that the knowledge that, yes, I can be independent, yes, I can do things. And at the times when I feel the most fragilely human, when I feel like I am very much just a finite collection of cells that will no longer exist at some point um i'm not alone that's something that connects me to other people and is something that we can all share 
Well, you know, huh. that's, 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 that's just where I went with that. But, you know, do with that what you will. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because um, I'm... I'm not. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, it's hey, so Sarah. beautiful. I, I asked Anya to come on this uh, show, <laughs> whatever it is, um, <laughs> because we've been friends, I guess, for about a year and a half or a year yeah. or something. We've both been in the Happy Startup School. Oh, this is Anya's signature. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I oh, thing, yeah, yeah. I, which I, they've I... now, Silicon Valley has now <laughs> actually made an emoji of. So you can now do an Anya. <laughs> There you go, Kieran. Thank you very much. Um, where yeah, because I'm a go? teenager still. Like, I, yeah. I, every time I do that, there's a part of me. And that's where the self-compassion comes in as well, because I was like, I, I do this habitually now, because particularly online, because you can't give people watch stuff like this, like it's on TV and don't respond. And I want to try and respond and say, hey, I hear you and I love Everyone's you. Everyone's now going to post the um, emoji <laughs> in the chat. I'd love that. That'd be hilarious. Um, I asked Anya to come on this because over the time that we've known each other, I found I've found consistently, but consistently, <laughs> that wherever we are, uh, and we attend something called Soul Cafe once every two weeks, and have done pretty religiously together for the past year or so. Um, there's always Anya seems to draw like pull out of the bag these resources, these literary poetic resources or you know points us to something else to look at and I feel that even if we're in the darkest of moments in discussion there's an exciting rabbit hole that we can go down which Anya has pointed us at and I just felt this was so relevant for this audience because um, people here are in the business of helping others mm. and as you say to be able to help others to contextualize their um, existence in the bigger universe of others and their lives is so comforting and also there's how that serves us as individuals building businesses um, I'll check in with the questions in a sec I can see we have one already um, and I wanted everyone to connect here by checking in in the chat with a resource that they are either reading something they're reading now something they are listening to now or something that in their lives has um, spoken to them which immediately comes to mind as a comforting resource something that they might not necessarily think about a lot but when asked to consider is actually at the you know back in you know back there in their minds um when you when you were talking just now Anya I remembered a quote from the Tempest which I studied uh let me think about this it will have been um, God, my maths is dreadful. 21 years ago. And I think it is, we are such stuff as dreams are made of and our little lives are rounded with a sleep. Correct? Prospero? Oh, that is a beautiful quote. I haven't studied the temper, so I'm not in a position to correct you, but that does sound... That does sound. Yes, that does sound very much. Yeah, um, it was. it's an amazing thing. And you remind me a bit of Prospero, I think, because... Prospero was modelled, they say, on... Well, Shakespeare modelled Prospero on himself because it was one of his last... I think it was the penultimate, I'll probably be corrected by someone here, mm. uh, play that he wrote. And it was such a reflection of his own experiences. Um, and, you know, another line in there is, lie there, mine art. And it's kind of like this kind of peaceful, um, like, letting go process um, mm. that Prospero goes through in the play. And... I feel with you, and we talk in our community a lot about, you know, should you be helping people who look like you? As in, you know, are going mm. through the same journey, the same pain, or are we better placed to protect ourselves and and oh. sort of create boundaries around ourselves and help others that are going through something different because it's just too raw for us to... So I wanted you to talk oh. to that because I know that for you, you know, <laughs> how is the work that you're doing connected to the work you do for others is basically where I was going. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, because I am a jukebox for quotes, um, as soon as you start talking about that particular um, challenge, I'm thinking of something which I learned from Michael McRae, who has a wonderful book, I'm Not Your Enemy. And he does it, talks a lot to, with people who talk about trauma and he talks he quotes Nadia Boltz Weber and she says 
preach from your wounds, not from your... No, preach from your scars, not from your wounds. And I know that Brene Brown also talks about this sort of thing of, you know, she will share stuff that's quite vulnerable, but it's after she's processed it. And I think it's it's that... It, it's your everyone's mileage is going to vary um you know i have my the condition i have is chronic fatigue syndrome um and i have you know had conversations with a couple of people who have had it and have done you know some eft emotional freedom technique on it and i was a little bit resistant at first i will admit because i felt it might be too close to home and actually one of the things which showed me that I had, oh, I don't want to put a quality of judgment on this, bugger. Um, at the time, I was surprised and delighted to see that I'd grown to a point where I can engage with that conversation um, at a point of, hmm serenity is the word that came into my mind actually serenity and compassion rather than um engulfment or or attachment because there's this thing of wanting to save someone in lieu of saving yourself in that i think and again it kind of comes to this idea of the wounded healer concept you know, is this coming from a well of unmet need? Are you trying to, to save other people because there's an aspect of yourself you're trying to save? Or is it because you've gone through the hero's journey and you've got to the point now where you've returned, to, you've returned home with all the treasures that you have discovered on your journey, um, which you know, then you are abundant, you are overflowing with these things and it makes sense to share them with your tribe you know and i think it also depends on your identity as well because a part of the reason why i've been resistant about doing anything specifically on my path is one i still have chronic fatigue syndrome you know i still live with it i had a 50 minute meditation this morning before coming on here <laughs> which is me lying in bed duvet on meditation time on so I don't miss this appointment um, with a bolster under my knees giving myself Reiki just kind of like meditating in a darkened room and just get you know, letting my body um, twitch and spasm actually because I was so tired and just letting the muscles relax um, so there is an aspect of you know do i do i have authenticity in this field to talk to people you know about oh yes you know here's my path i've been here and i've been here you can achieve this too it's kind of like here's my path still on it hello um and that if we kind of like zoom out you know we can see the whole territory of annual world and that is merely one path in a whole. There's canyons, there's hills, there's mountains, there's a couple of farmsteads, which I've never noticed before. Holy crap. Um, you know. <laughs> so it kind of depends on whether how, how zoomed in you are on your identity and whether it is something which you hang everything else on, you know, or whether it is just something which you know, you look at it and you go, well, yes, there's, there's that, there's that trading route from here to here, but there's also, you know, we've also got a seaport, apparently they're starting up a university over on the other side of that mountain, so I'm really going to have to investigate that. I'm getting news reports now from this, like, there's stuff going on here that even I was not aware of. By the way, this is something which I do, just to let you know the way that I'm, my, my mind works. I think very metaphorically and I think quite visually. And so when I start talking like this, I will see words. Um, if when people, I'm listening to people, um, sometimes they will jump up out of my keyboards, but usually it's kind of like some kind of animation or image that starts coming up as I'm, as I'm talking. And, and, and it's as much a surprise to me as it is to the listener. <laughs> oh 
my god, there's so much going on now. It's going to speak to people. <laughs> there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> I mean, so one question that is being asked by Sarah, although I think it's been partly answered, is what's mm. the difference between vulnerability and fragility? Or the connection, Ooh. in your opinion? And I think you've spoken to it. Um, and the, the, to... the, the other thing that I think is coming out of this, which is very relevant to our audience, is the working out loud thing. And um, we also ask people to, to kind of try and work out what their method is in their coaching approach. And, you know, you describing visualizations for yourself and how it works. It, it, one is getting a real sense of what it's like to work with you. And we talk about, <laughs> you know, you like, identifying how you work as a coach and yeah. then and then offering people the gift of um, an experience of what it's like to work with you through marketing um, mm. because the meta sort of energy that people will get from from engaging with you in your marketing is a sense of what it is to work with you and and that's what I really feel when we talk to mm. you is a real sense of what it is to work with you <laughs> what you see is what you get people <laughs> And yet it's so, and yet it's so con like contained. Like you are, you are so self-aware, and you talk about um, sort of not being um, sort of bound up in your own experience so much that you can't be, that there isn't distance between your wounds and the work you're trying to do for others. So it's it's both incredibly generous and transparent and possibly vulnerable. I don't know if you'd use that word. And at the same time, so contained and focused on, on the hero as you are as the guide. Yeah. Oh, there's so many different things I want to say in response to that. The first one is the quote that came up into my mind when you're talking about the difference between vulnerability and fragility. And it's from um, Julia Cameron in The Artist's Way, I think. You know, treating myself as a precious object will make me strong. And so I think it's this idea of recognizing what those terms mean for us and recognizing that vulnerability can often be a doorway to connection. You know, yes, it might be vulnerable for me to share the way that I, I think, and I do it because, well, f well firstly, because I, I, I think my brain is fun, you know, so I have a head start on this. It's not like I have any shame with it. I'm like going, wow, this is crazy shit going on here. I must tell someone about this. Um, but also because I am aware that when someone else doesn't know what's going on, that can leave them feeling, well, the word that actually comes to mind is lonely, you know, and so... I'm kind of inviting them into my world. Now, it's always an invite rather than an expectation, but it's saying, okay, this is, this is what's happening here. In case you're wondering why I'm looking around, why I seem to be a little bit distracted, this is what's going on for me. And so you know that um, it comes back to this word presence, actually. And just showing, trying to be as present with the other person by revealing what's present for me at the time and actually being able to articulate that in real time. I guess this is one of the experiences I've had of when, I ha when my body has failed me, actually narrating my experience to the people who were helping me. One of my friends calls me a, a one woman team building exercise at these times. <laughs> Because it's like, okay, you get her shoes, you carry this bit, you carry her, you know. But actually just articulating it, and even to the point of going, you know, there was a particular time I remember. Um, and I was almost, I was leaning against something, someone was helping me, and I just went, I'm just getting hit by a really big wave of shame right now. You know, and it's like, oh, nothing to be ashamed of. I say, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I'm just kind of just, just actually saying it out loud to diffuse it to diffuse the shame again Brene Brown you know she says you know shame cannot live you know in daylight you know it, it, it needs to be unspoken 
for it to, to, to prosper. I've seen Simon is like nodding his head so much that I love it. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's kind of, I just wanted to pick up on, on that bit in particular, I think. You know, I think when we are fragile, that tends to be when, ooh, okay. Choosing one's audience. Sorry, something has just like popped up. You can tell that's what's happening right now. Something's just going doink. Um, choosing one's audience. And... Hmm, there are people with whom our fragility is safe. It is nurtured. It is cherished. It is held. This is a gift which, hmm, may not be given to everyone we encounter and that's okay. Yeah, I don't know where that came from. It's, it's <laughs> kind of uncanny. No, it's uncanny. <laughs> difficult for me, Sarah says. I'm saying uncanny, Sarah's saying difficult. Uh, but so real, obviously, and I think for probably many people. Um, yeah, just re accepting that some relationships might be more nourishing than others. And this this really goes to the heart of why you. And, you know, we're not in the business of scaremongering people into either thinking about problems that they didn't necessarily think they had and have, you know, got to be careful <laughs> around that. Hmm. Or you know, trying to trying to convince someone to work with us um, by shaming or pointing a finger at how someone else might not show up for them, and yet there is the reality that you know some people might be better placed to work with you at this time. And how can you compassionately sort of show that with such care and love and kindness, um, make them feel so seen and understood? And, and see at the same time that not everyone might welcome them into the world in that way is what I'm taking from what you... Don't worry, Greta. Um, let's see what you're saying. Uh, just join now. Uh, you've just explained to me why I provide a constant narrative that I have often judged myself for. So much wisdom <gasps> packed into five. I mean, yeah, always with Anya. Hi. Hi, happy startup school. Don't oh, worry hello, about being darling. Um, Yeah. Can I just share one last thing? And then I'd love to hear from Simon, if that's okay, to see what he's, because you, Simon, you've been giving me so much um, non-verbal encouragement. It's been so wonderful. Um, I deeply appreciate it, and you. Um, something I, the Tad Hargraves, Hargraves, who I know you're a fan of at Better Bolder Raven, um, and Michael Margolis has written a lovely book, um, uh, 10X, you know, about story and the impact the story has. Did a wonderful, like, webinar ages ago. A very handsome webinar with the two of them together. Um, talking about, you know, this thing of being a coach and clients basically walking along the dockside, looking at the captains, looking at the different crafts, and actually getting a sense of, okay, so who do, I, who do I want to travel with? Who do I want to go on this journey with? You know, and it can be so individual and just looking at and getting a sense of who do I trust to take me across these waters, to take me to the destination I want to go to. And perhaps this idea of, even just throwing it in there, you know, we will, a good coach or a therapist will, you know, certainly take someone where they want to go, but, but quite possibly take them to places they didn't even know could be discovered. You know, and it's having the trust in the captain, you know, liking the cut of someone's jib, however you wish to, to interpret that, um, who you can feel because there's something about leaving the safety of harbour and literally the letter H just jumped up out of my keyboard. That's, yeah, it's just getting quite, quite distracting now. Um, you know, 
it's the, oh, it's that phrase, you know, ships are safe in harbour, but that's not what they were built for. And actually having someone who can steer a craft for us. And when I think about the, the actual, the boat, you know, that's a metaphor for our, for our methodology, you know, for our approach, for our, the, the paradigms we work in, um, who can then, yeah, take us on safe passage to the destination that we choose. No, and with the knowledge that actually it's the journey that transforms us. So, yeah. Simon, I, I would love to um, hear what's landing for you. And uh, at some point I'll get back to whatever the topic is as well. I, I promise. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's 50 50 at this time. We've still got half an hour to go. Anything can happen, people. <laughs> it's I, half know, time. I know, I get it's the half time. <laughs> I would say for me, the, the point you raised about um, that kind of feeling of authenticity and not having to have all the answers was quite interesting because I think there is this assumption that either as a coach or you know, someone who's mentoring someone that you have to have all the answers. And actually, I think you don't necessarily have to know everything about it or be the most knowledgeable person mm. on that topic. And I think just recognizing that you only really have to be slightly ahead of where the people are in order to add value to what their experience yeah. is, or to add something to what their experience is. And I think once you kind of get around that, then actually, it becomes easier to talk out loud and you know the attachment perhaps to shame of saying well I have this opinion about this sort of dissipates because yeah. you're no longer saying well I can only express an opinion I can only talk about my coaching work I can only talk about what I do if I am mm. the expert in the room mm. and saying well actually I don't need to be the expert in the room I just have to be talking about it with authenticity and saying well yeah. my lived experience is this or you know, a conversation I've had is this, and not 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 trying to solve all the problems every time you have a conversation or make a post on social or something like that. Hmm. Mm. Because I think what you're hinting at is the role of perfectionism, actually, and and yeah. needing to get it right versus. You know, I'm kind of like, I'm being drawn into like the idea of the three principles right now. This idea of, you know, we all have, you know, the, these things in common, you know, about the, the, going back to this common humanity thing, which I kicked off with, you know, we are all alive, we're alive. You know, last time I checked, let me just do the pulse thing. No, I've got a pulse. I think I'm alive. Yeah, everyone else just check. Yeah, I think, I, I don't think, I, I don't think we are ghosts in the machine. I think we might actually be, you know, living humans. And, you know, there's, there's a level, we have different levels of, of, of experiencing that aliveness. Um, and we're able to do that because we're aware, you know, we have a level of consciousness, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes our consciousness means that it feels like everything is happening to us. Sometimes that level of consciousness rises so we can get again, a different perspective. And then you know, the last one is, you know, that we think this is part of being human. Um, and, you know, sometimes we have a lot of the times what we're hearing is mental chatter in our minds. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think he's on the call now, but I think Chris Kenworthy, who is of Better Boulder Baby, will appreciate my, my next uh, uh, analogy stroke metaphor. Um, we t I know that for myself, I can take a lot of my thoughts quite seriously and actually it's mental gas. It's the equivalent of the digesting for experiences and situations and sensations. And what's resulted is like with any digestive system, some of it, some of the nutrients are going to be extracted and sometimes it's just going to be a fart. <laughs> and yet we assume, we assume that everything that goes, you know, I know, I assume everything that goes to my mind might well be, yeah, less less so now. Generally, I just think, ah, oh, it's just another fault. Um, but when we 
grip onto this idea of being an expert, when we grip onto things needing to be a certain way, you know, in, in acceptance commitments therapy, we talk about being psychologically flexible. And I always demonstrate it with my hands, you know, the acceptance, we often refuse things, we're shielding ourselves from experience and often gripping onto other things, you know, which, um, which we believe to be true. And in this kind of position, it's very hard to be receptive. You have your hands literally open to receiving new thinking. Because I think that might be what people are really hungry for. You know, Joseph Campbell talks about, you know, what we're really looking for is the rapture of being alive. And so if, you're, if, you're, if you are grabbing onto this idea that I must have all the answers oh, I don't have value, because that's the thing you're shielding yourself from. I must have the, 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 all the answers. I must be the expert in the room because I'm shielding myself from this feeling that I am not enough. I am inadequate. I'm not lovable. You know, I'm broken goods, whatever it might be. Again, you know, have, have just, you know, this, this will not translate on the podcast if you're listening on, 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 uh, on the car stereo, but it just trust me, like, if you have an image of someone with their hand up flat against you and then the other hand is in a grip, kind of like a clenched fist, how inviting is that to engage with? <laughs> and even as I'm doing it now, you know, I'm struggling to see over these things. These things are obscuring my vision, obscuring my ability to connect so Simon yeah. <clears throat> yeah I think the other thing that came up for me there is a thing that people often think of when they're thinking about either putting themselves or their work out there is there well, what if people don't like it and I think yeah. that's another thing that people try and shield themselves from is the well I need everybody to like everything I'm putting out I need everybody to agree or everybody to be happy or pleased or energized by what I'm doing and yeah. I think again that's another thing that's important to let go of is that there will be there will be people out there who don't get it who don't resonate with what you're saying and and that's okay because yeah. your work or what you're saying isn't isn't for them and maybe they're just not ready to hear it yet or you know it's 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 not for everyone and I think those to me are the two of the biggest hurdles we encounter with our work in terms of people not wanting to make a video or not wanting to make a podcast or not feeling comfortable when doing I don't know something else in in marketing and it is I, I, I to me it comes down mainly to those two things of thinking you need to be the expert before you can say anything and wanting mm. everybody to like what you're going to say yeah just speak which might be oversimplifying it a little bit but those are the two sort of <laughs> well, well, big, you know, big themes yeah 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 the big things you know they, they, they probably maybe 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 capture 80 percent of it you know got some yeah, outliers yeah. and stuff of course yeah but you know i've got like like a twin double peak kind of graph thing going on um i think and what's interesting about that is the role of authenticity in that and moving into the realm of vulnerability you know which requires us to the phrase is coming to mind it's expose our soft underbelly to others you know and a sense of lacking separation between what we put out and our self-worth and our value and take if someone doesn't like something that we put out it's not that they don't like this the thing that we have put out they don't like us and that's and so I'm just you know curious in, in the chat you know to people who are listening you know you know that that tension between so does that get easier or harder the more authentic you are because for me my sense, my experience is the more authentic I am, the more I own myself, the more the locus of approval is, if it's kind of like in a, um, 
energy field. Okay, we're going with that, are we? Okay, we're going with energy field. It's like an energy field. It's like like a like a like a, a, a I am surrounded by a circle, and you know, the further out it goes from the circle, the more it goes towards someone else, and it might overlap with like a Venn diagram. Might overlap with them, but the locus of self value and self worth. The closer it is to me, and the more that I can feel proud of what I'm doing, the win is me getting it out there, not the response necessarily that it gets from others. Because that that bit I can't control. It's 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 being process versus outcome orientated. You know, if I can control the process of this, if I can buy through self compassion through. Um, recognizing my needs, um, being able to attune to what it is I want to communicate, and having that as my point of success, then you know, I'm, I, 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 I don't know. It, if it feels to me in this moment, you know, being very clear in this moment that having, I've already won before I've even sent stuff out. If I've got over something for myself, and anything that happens after that is gravy, uh, but I can see that Carlos is po post posting a lot of stuff in the chat, so I feel we should um, we should we should look at that. <laughs> Don't be sorry, love. I just hope you're you're you're, you're getting better from COVID. Um, yeah, what he's saying that what I've experienced is the working with the uncertainty of where a coach engagement can go. That's what the client is hoping for, and then what is possible through the emerging process. And I'm not sure if authenticity protects you from the fear of being judged. I think, oh. No, you are. I don't think it can protect you from the fear of being judged. But what I might suggest is that it is easier to access it may be easier to access self-compassion if one is being authentic because then that relies on you having connection with yourself and to actually again like those 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 three pillars i mentioned earlier the mindfulness bit oh okay i actually feel judged or you know i feel fear of being judged here what can i do to to address that oh actually that's what yeah, it's part of being a social species we don't want to be kicked out the tribe um and then it feels like this idea of authenticity about letting go of expectations of how people receive your words. Yeah. Yeah, because another phrase which I love, you know, today's expectations are tomorrow's resentments. You know, so if you're expecting a certain response and it doesn't happen and you feel that um, life is shit if it doesn't, um, it's 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 the Buddha. It's the second hour of suffering. You know, we are already suffering from our experience, and then you know we are adding these sec these additional arrows of oh, it shouldn't happen like this. Oh, why is it happening? The frustration and things. Whereas actually, sometimes you know, m again, Michael Neal, more full stops, fewer commas. I'm feeling shit about this. Full stop rather than I'm feeling shit about this because da, 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 four hours later, a whole narrative that's been created that you then uh, shield yourself from having changed and then grip onto because it's the truth and it makes you feel better. Um, so, yeah, uh, I feel like I should pause for breath and let someone interrupt. Um, <laughs> I can just like I can just like read like the comments and respond to the comments, but I feel like you know it's not just me here, and I should like stuff. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because um, the length of people's comments I think is reflective of the amount of thought that is going yeah. on for people right now as a result of what you're saying, um, and something that I'm thinking about is just how I mean we talk about mm. marketing as being another mirror to yourself and um, the thing I'm thinking about is is the drama triangle of victim persecutor rescuer mm. and creator well the alternative thing yeah. is to be a creator um, and I think your relationship to as as Melanie says um, 
we are only really responsible we can only be responsible for half of the experience when we put something out there because we can't control how others receive us um and similarly in any relationship we are only responsible we can only be responsible for what we ourselves put into it and what others reflect back to us or put into it themselves is nothing that we can control Mm. and it's the same in marketing so to be able to ground ourselves uh, as John Paul describes like a grass blowing in the wind um, in our own values um, anchored to the soil you're growing I think that's beautiful Mm. Um, it's it's that sort of I'm neither a victim to what other people you know my experience of myself is my experience of myself and what I gift is what I gift and what you experience is your experience and not to be too discombobulated always by the words that you receive which goes back to Carlos's comments about authenticity um, and so much we can learn from this marketing experience and I think that's why it scares people I think people are scared because they think they might go wrong they might not do the right thing they might not plan properly they may have too many products they don't know what to focus on they can't price in a way that they feel is going to work for them they feel mm. unconfident but I think the other thing is is that people under the surface know how much when you do this work in putting yourself out there, mm. you're actually um, addressing any number of your relationships in your life, not just with yourself, but with others. And so this is why it's important work, but this is also why it's difficult work. And if we can mm. weave in resources, as you do, Anya, in presenting a case I don't know why that's coming up my father's a solicitor my father's a solicitor I'm going to blame him for that one but you know it's like if you want to make something compelling as a case then you know to weave in previous cases to be able to tell good stories to be able to allude to another experience when something was won in court you know is to kind of get somebody to to get why this is worth listening to if you like or you know possibly Mm. right whatever that means but then also for yourself to kind of be grounded in in sort of another person's experiences to kind of stop yourself from being un um you know unanchored as as John Paul says mm. yeah gosh Carlos I feel like you should jump on <laughs> yeah yeah I, I, I'm just wondering God, I just no, love it okay. so um okay. <laughs> I, I think well What's coming up for me as I uh, read Carlos's wonderful contributions? Hmm. You know, I, as you mentioned in the beautiful uh, introduction to me and my work, you know, I am one of the co-facilitators of the, uh, the Happiness Facilitator Training at the Museum of Happiness. And we, you know, we talk to a lot of people who are wanting to affect change in the world and in other people's experiences. And we use what we call a head, heart and hands model. And the head part is sharing the science of happiness, you know, sharing the research and stuff. And we, you know, then the heart is giving people an experience of something and the hands is, you know, a tool to take away. But the head aspect, you know, very often we are wedded to the intellect, you know, and I put my hands up to that. You know, you can look books, a couple of books, like more books. There's some more books over here. There's like some books over there, you know. Um, Actually, you know, either explicitly or implicitly offering something which allows the intellect <laughs> okay the phrase that's just come into my mind is you give the intellect a cup of tea and a cookie you sit it down the jigsaw puzzle you say it's all right we've got you covered don't worry you, you know pacify the intellect to a certain extent let it know that it's all okay we can trust this person is a good person again we have this neuroceptive sense i, look, I haven't even gone into polyvagal theory yet okay here we go um our bodies without our conscious awareness are constantly scanning for warning and welcome you know and having 
these tools, these mechanisms for us to get a sense of, oh, okay, so this is safe. This is a, this is a welcome for me. You know, if I, if I believe what happens next, I will not be made a fool of. I just want to nod to Greta's amazing idea <laughs> to create a pacify the intellect poster. <laughs> with a cup of tea and juice and... I can see like a fabulous like poster. Yeah, we'll have it in the Better Boulder Believer. Like, well, like we're always talking about merch. At the oh yeah, listen, I'm school. all like, I've, the school for, school of life is yeah. my go to merch online oh, shop. Yeah. Check it out. Oh, and absolutely. if I when Simon and I have got 400 more hours in our week, I'm basically building a Better Bold of Raven merch shop. And so far this week, as Kieran knows, in there is uh, granola, Better Boulder Braver Breakfast, I'm going to call it. Um, and now we've got an amazing, um, except Kieran's given me a ridiculous recipe, some Machu Picchu coffee what uh, I, and I'm like okay I'll try um, and then now we have this fabulous poster thank you Greta um, yeah. you might have to join our community not least because I want some more merch ideas it's fantastic <laughs> um, anyway don't know why where we what the merch maybe we need well, to maybe <laughs> let's end <laughs> mindful of time as well yeah if, oh yes what I was going to say is I don't do, we don't do this but if I was going to invite you Anya because you can post in the chat of this um, event after it as well. And, you know, for example, Polyvagal, you know, if you have a resource oh. that you'd like to post in the chat for anyone listening to this on repeat, um, and we can put it in the show notes, uh, anything that comes to mind that you think people here might appreciate as a result of this chat, please just go ahead and post it in the chat. Yeah, 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 but we'll do. And just to say... Um a really simple way of understanding it is if you actually go on my website and you, you there's, I do a little thing like a facilitator's guide, which, um, which you can, you know, you, you can unsubscribe afterwards. It's fine. I, but I won't be offended. Um, yeah, you can go on there if you scroll down and that will give you like a really gentle introduction and a way of understanding polyvagal theory, um, quite quite simply and there's also a wonderful uh video um nerd night i think if you just basically uh google nerd night polyvagal theory stephen portridge's son does a wonderful 28 minute talk which basically is like i don't want to say all you need to know but it, that's a really really swift and engaging primer on it i i don't want people here to to, I don't want you to be uh, humble, Anya, in describing or, you know, my invitation is, can you please explain to people how you like to work with people in coaching? You know, what kind of people do you find gravitate to you? What people do you enjoy working with the most? Um, you know, and just sort of, are you welcoming invitations to work with them at the moment? Would you like to just talk a little bit about your coaching work yourself for us? Yeah. I, I I I will thank you for that invitation and and for for the um the elbow nudge I could feel in my ribs as you did that. <laughs> so yeah, I mean this is why I call myself an intuitive advisor because I think if you've watched this so far this is basically what you get but it will just be on the conversation that we'd have. <laughs> and anything that you bring to it, you know, I will there will be resources that come to mind. I will hear things between what you're saying. I will connect dots between what you're saying, uh, reflect back, you know, particular pictures. Um, and I tend to, the people who tend to gravitate to me tend to be people who are towards the higher, more the, the sensitive side. Um, I identify as a highly sensitive person. I have a dash of neurodiversity. People tend to be along those scales. Um, they tend to want to make a positive impact in the world. Um, they tend to, I mean, you've got to have a sense of humour. <laughs> I think. Um, because... There will be stages when I will say, and I've got, and I've learnt now. 
I do I do preface it, but I will be saying things like, can I say the shitty thing out loud? So, you know, you can be highly sensitive, but maybe not necessarily wholly thin skinned. <laughs> But it's all done lovingly, loving provocation, I guess. To me, highly sensitive sits in the same camp as um, where I am in my cycle, for example. And it's about consent and permission and invitation yeah. and safe spaces. And like you say, it's not, it's not that you cannot ever receive any information that might be painful, but it's entirely the package and the bow as Simon has used as an idea for it. How, like, how pretty is the bow that's on the box? You know, it's really meaningful to me. And are you shit sandwiching this feedback for me or are you just vomiting at me? Um, because of course that's not going to be very nice. Thank you very much. But uh, yeah. And also it's kind of like, it's, it's, I think it's not just the bow and the package. It's the why you're giving it whether it will help expand the receiver, whether it is, you know, because I have one of my um, personal hmm, challenges. I'm, I'm doing my, holding my hand out flat so you can see both sides of it right now because it's, it's the two sides of the same coin. One of them is burden, the other one is gift. And actually... They're the same, you know, it's what, what do you, how do you respond to something which you weren't expecting? You know, you can either ex receive it as a gift or you can receive it as a burden and actually trying to offer things to the other person so that they are gifts to take away, that they are gifts and catalysts which perhaps disrupt habitual thinking which keeps them trapped and in pain and suffering that's why you know the humor thing that can shift our state you mm. know we can that can just nudge us out of a uh, out of particular cognitive groove so because what we're really looking for is new thinking you know when i was talking about you know the common humanity you know we're alive we're aware we think most of the time we are caught up in our mental chatter and i love you know, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Love the two models of, of performance. Um, you know, and normally it's performance equals capacity plus information. So if you know better, you do better. But actually, I think one of the gifts and why a lot of people come to coaching for clarity is the second model, which again, you know, I attribute to, to, to Michael Neal. Um, performance equals capacity minus interference. And to be honest, the interference almost entirely consists of insecure thinking. Not that we are insecure, but our insecure thinking, our mental chatter. Yes, that, the thought storms. And we take them so seriously. Again, and then it's like, well, of course, there's a lot of like turbulence and stuff. There's a lot of brain farting going on, you know. <laughs> mm. And just waiting for, you know, the, the shaken up snow globe just to settle down a little bit. So we I want, I want people to consider in this something which we really ask coaches to consider. When people are pricing for time mm. as opposed to outcome, mm. uh, as Carlos and Ben say, uh, you know, we can lose sight of the journey that we're going to take people on. If we're saying, you know, an hour of my time cost this what we're not doing ourselves justice on uh or around uh is is the idea of that constant practice that you talk about and the habitual thinking that you can help people establish and i think it's seeing patterns and connecting dots and what might happen from one session to another with a client and the journey that will allow you to help somebody to see if something is, uh, you know, for example, continually hijacking your experience mm. of life. And yes, you can do wonders in one session. You know, I, I can absolutely vouch for that in the experience of being with Anya. <laughs> but to actually paint a picture for your client of how, you know, being able to kind of be in each other's presence a number of times and seeing what comes up over the course of conversations as themes, mm will do so much more to flag 
constant experiences that you may not be understanding a hijacking as you're as you're describing um the chatter so i just want people to you know i just want to make sure that i've left off today saying to people you know this isn't just about one-off conversations it's about being aware of a number of conversations and, and connecting the dots in those conversations that's in, that, that I find to be important in my interactions with you, Anya. Oh, thank you. And, and actually just, you know, I, I will be closing for time in a moment, but I just need to, this thing of, you know, painting a picture for a client makes me think of the Edgar Degas co- uh, quote, art is not what you see, it is what you make others see. Mm-hmm. I think that feels really pertinent you know, in response to what you share, because it's not just about painting the picture for the client. It's about actually setting, pointing out the colours, setting up the tools. And so that they're painting, that they, they can start, they can, it, 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 it's co-work, really, it's co-creative. And again, for me, that's why I'm a bit more like process rather than outcome. Um, you know, allowing someone the canvas you know what I might do is identify oh so you've got cerulean blue there nice you know here's some you know here's some lovely ochre to go with that or whatever or you know just noticing oh actually you know I'd had a session last week with someone she was actually showing me vision boards and I was like just going have you noticed seeing the thematic themes between the pictures that she had been selecting you know it's having that fresh eye and again, it's not about what we create, it's about what you help other people see in that. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Anya. Simon, any final <laughs> thoughts? Because we could go on all day, obviously. <laughs> but, you know, we've got lunches, we've got, we've got homes to go to, people. <laughs> well, yeah, I think there's certainly a lot to think about, and I think it's, it's definitely one of those sort of topics as you say that we could explore over and over again so um yeah thank you very much for sharing and thanks very much everybody in the chat for getting involved with the conversation uh and chiming in it's always good to hear from everybody so yes thank you very much everybody for listening and watching thank you much uh, and yet again and we'll see you next time take care everyone bye Bye.